Hi everybody, welcome to CompuScholar's professional development webinars for the 2022 school year. There's been a lot of interest in our Unity game programming course, so we're going to kick things off here in September by talking through some of the logistical details involved with managing this course. My name is Chris Eust. I spent quite a few years as a software engineer before joining CompuScholar and beginning to write curriculum. I'm always happy to answer your questions and comments. You're welcome to email me directly at chris.eust at compuscholar.com. Some of you may be wondering why you should be thinking about teaching a video game design course, and the truth is that today's students are really immersed in video games on their phones and on their computers, and video game programmer is often an occupation that, that many middle and high school students can kind of see themselves doing. Uh, but this, the secret, right, is that while we're doing this video game design course, we're actually going to teach them some serious coding skills. So for us, it's all about using game design as a lure to get into computer science and to start learning some coding skills. And that way, even if your students don't end up working in the video game industry at the end of the day, uh, they still have the skills and the career path uh, that will be very high paying and stable throughout their lives. We selected Unity as our game development platform. This is a super popular platform. It's very powerful and it supports all kinds of 2D and 3D games. You can deploy Unity games across all major platforms like phones and PCs and so forth. Uh, it is a full IDE. It has scripting support through Visual Studio. It includes a full physics engine and many, many more useful features. The website for Unity is at unity.com and I'll show you that here very briefly. So this is the main Unity website, and I just wanted to show it to you uh, so that you understand there's tons and tons of things out here uh, regarding Unity, support, all kinds of demonstration games, lots and lots of information here on the Unity website. Uh, by and large, to complete the course, you and your students will not need to come out here to this website at all, with the possible exception of coming out to download the IDE initially, and we'll cover that in just a moment. So when you're getting your classroom ready to teach our Unity game programming course, there are a couple of things you must do. Uh, first, you must make sure you've got either a Windows or a Mac OS computer that is capable of running the Unity IDE and Visual Studio Community Edition. So these two development environments come as a package, and they are both required in order to create games with the Unity platform. So make sure you have a lot of computers that are Windows or Mac OS, uh, so you cannot install Unity, for example, on Chromebooks. Uh, the second thing you must do is you must license uh, each of those software packages that you install on your lab computers. Licensing is free. It's something you need to do with Unity, uh, and there are a couple of different options. You can use a free personal license if you happen to have an email address that you can attach to each one of your lab computers that's capable of clicking on a response email. Uh, you can also contact Unity and get their free educational grants, which gives you a licensing package that is ideal for lab deployments across multiple machines. Uh, we do recommend that you pre-install and you pre-license all of the software on your lab computers before your students come in. And we have some detailed instructions in Chapter 1, and let me show you where to find those instructions right now. So I'm logged in here uh, in the Unity Game Programming course as a student. Let's go into Chapter 1, and we'll scroll down, and you can see the Chapter 1 activity is installing Unity software with some instructions. And these instructions provide links to installing Unity on Mac OS and on Windows. So these are step-by-step -step instructions. You can just click on those PDFs and then follow the steps in order to install the software. So again, you will need to both install the software and license the software. Uh, there are links to the educational grants within those PDFs if you want to take advantage of that. Uh, so be sure that you and or your IT team has carefully reviewed these instructions and gotten Unity installed on your computers and properly licensed before your students are ready to start work. Now I will note that the Unity IDE has new versions all the time. They release new versions multiple times a year. And our advice is just to pick a version and stick with it. Uh, you don't need to keep upgrading your IDE every month or two when they prompt you with a, a new little dot version. Uh, just pick a version that's reasonably current at the start of your school year, and then you don't need to upgrade after that. Any newer IDE that you pick will automatically upgrade any older project it encounters. So what that means is when you download a project from within our course, perhaps a starter project or a solution project, those projects will be updated to whatever version of the IDE you currently have. And those course projects as of today are at version 2020.3.8, so you can use any version of the Unity IDE that you would like from that point forward. Uh, and again, when you download the projects from the course and you open them in a newer IDE, 
uh, that newer IDE will upgrade them automatically as a one-time exercise. Now, if you do pick a newer IDE, that's perfectly fine. Uh, you may encounter some minor cosmetic differences in the way the IDE operates or presents information, but all the features that we describe in the course are pretty basic and they should still work as described. Uh, naturally, if you encounter any problems or confusion with the newer version of the IDE, definitely let us know and we'll take a look at it and update any course material that may need changing. So most of you probably know this from our standard professional development, but quizzes and tests are built into the course. All of the quizzes and tests are hidden by default, and so when you are ready for your students to take those assessments, you just need to unhide them, which is a very simple process. And then from, from a grading standpoint, all those quizzes and tests are automatically graded and will show up in your gradebook. So let's go see what this looks like. All right, I'm still logged in as a student. And I'm inside chapter one, and if we scroll down a little bit, you'll see that the chapter one lesson one quiz is already unhidden, and I've already actually taken that as a student and gotten a grade. So the teacher unhid this quiz already, and I've already completed this assessment as a student. In additional lessons, those quizzes are not visible, so the teacher has not made them uh, available to the students yet. Let's switch over to the teacher account. And from this teacher account, if we scroll down, you can see the quizzes are marked as hidden from students. If you want to publish them for student use, just click on the eyeball icon. That will make the quiz visible. And then we can switch back to the student account. And now in the student account, we can see that chapter one lesson two quiz as well. When students want to take the quiz, they'll just click on it. Attempt. And I'm just going to put in a bunch of random answers here in the interest of time. And click finish. And submit. And submit. All right. And then you can see the uh, quiz was automatically graded. I just guessed wildly and got one out of five right. If we go back to the course as a student, that grade is now visible in the student's gradebook. From the teacher perspective, if you want to check on your student's progress, you can click on View Gradebook. And then scroll down and you'll see the quiz grades that your student is accumulating. So that's all there is to quizzes and tests. That's pretty straightforward. Now let's talk about student projects and their hands-on work. Uh, Unity is an offline IDE, so it's not part of our system. So the students will be working on their local computers. And there are two sources of programming activities. First, we have work with me exercises within many of the lessons. These are recommended but not required. So they're there to ensure the students are comfortable with the lesson material. They've got uh, confidence building exercises that are not submitted or graded by the teacher. And the solutions are visible in the teacher's lesson guide. Um, later on within the chapters, we have chapter activities. So these are larger graded coding projects. They are graded by the teacher with rubrics that are in our system. Uh, students have a number of options for submitting files that we'll talk about in a moment. And the teachers have easy access to solution guides and so forth. So let's go take a look. We'll start off from the student perspective. Let's go into chapter two, which has the first coding exercises. I'll scroll down a bit and click on chapter two, lesson three text. And if we scroll way down to the end, you can see the work with me exercise that I was describing. So again, these are ungraded confidence building exercises. They give students step-by-step -step instructions on doing something in their local installed Unity IDE. And they should be able to pretty easily replicate the steps that are described here within this exercise. Now, if we flip over to the teacher account and go into chapter two, we'll scroll down to lesson three and click on the teacher's guide. Scroll down towards the bottom and you can see a brief description of how to solve that work with me exercise. When the exercises get a little bit more complicated, you'll actually be able to download a zip file of the completed uh, exercise here. So you can always see a completed solution for how we ask students to do certain things. So again, those work with me exercises are not submitted or graded. They're there as confidence builders. Flipping back to the student view and looking a little bit further down, you can see this is the chapter activity. And so activity is our keyword for a, a graded submission. Students will pull up the activity instructions. And the activity instructions are generally step by step and contain everything the students need to know in order to complete the exercise. 
in this very first activity, there's some guidance on how to submit work. So let's pause here for a moment. Uh, students are generating files offline and they need to communicate those to the teacher in some form or fashion so the teacher can assign a grade. And there's a few ways you can do that. And these are really up to you as the teacher. So as a teacher, you can elect to simply look at the work that's on the student's computer. So you don't need to have the students move files anywhere if you don't want to. So you just look over the student's shoulder and uh, you know see what they've done from that fashion. So that's an option. Um, you could also ask the students to copy their project files to any desired uh, sharing location that you've identified. It could be a shared network drive or a Google folder or a Dropbox or something like that. So if you want students to copy their, their projects out that way, then you can advise them to do that. And then the third option is actually upload the coursework uh, online through our system. So if students want to do that, we ask that they create a zip file of their entire project directory, and they can upload that zip file directly into the activity within the course. And so you will notice that students should be coming to you if you don't communicate with them right away and asking how you want these projects submitted for a grade. So be thinking about that and communicate your preferences to your students so they know how to give you the work. If you do elect to have them zip up the projects and submit to you online through our course interface, we do have instructions for creating zip files here uh, within the activity, as well as a little walkthrough of actually submitting the project itself. Let me close this. And students will submit their work online if you want them to do that by clicking on the activity. And then scroll down, click on Add Attempt. Now I'm going to pull up a file explorer. And I'm bypassing the actual activity itself so your students will work in the Unity IDE. They will create a project based on the instructions and then create this zip file, something that looks a little bit like this. So what I'll do is simply drag the zip file into the file area. And when it's done, as a student, I'll click Save Changes. All right, and I'll scroll down here and click Submit Assignment. And continue. All right, so this assignment is now submitted for grading, so that means it's waiting on teacher action in order to actually receive a grade. And remember, your students are only going to go through this submission process if you want them to submit files online through our course interface. If you've selected some other submission mechanism, they won't need to go through the submit process at all. Let's go back to the teacher view. So as a teacher, you can review and grade the student's work with the same link. Let's go into chapter two, scroll down and click on the same activity link. By the way, you'll notice here is a link to the solution files as well as the solution guide. So any coded activity we have the students do, you have access to the full files as well as a solution guide. But let's click on the activity link itself. View all submissions. And you can see here is the zip file that the student has uploaded for you. So you can click on the zip file, download it to your computer, unzip it, and then load the project into your own Unity IDE in order to observe the student's work. If students have submitted files to you outside of our system through some other mechanism, then naturally you won't see the file itself here, but you'll still have the grade button in order to assign a grade. When you are ready to grade, whether or not there's actually a file here, uh, you can click on the grade button. And then scroll down and just kind of point and click your way through the rubric here based on what you observed in the student's project. And you can see the grade is calculated here. You can leave some feedback if you want to. And then at the very bottom, there's a Save Changes button. And we'll click OK. And so now this is graded. Let's go back to the course. We can go into the gradebook. And here is the student's grade that you just assigned for their submitted activity. So this is the way that your students will make progress through the course. They will take the automatically graded quizzes and tests, and those will show up here. Uh, and then you as a teacher will grade their projects as they are submitted and those grades will show up in the gradebook as well. So just a quick reminder, uh, at the beginning of the class, you will want to communicate with your students and make sure they understand how you want them to submit work, whether it's through our system or through some other means that you define. And you'll also need to grade those student projects when they come in, and you can use the rubrics that are provided in our system. Thanks for joining us on this webinar. I hope it was useful to you. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can call us or contact us through our website or send me an email directly.